Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to machine learning. Today, uh, Luis and I will uh, present uh, generative adversarial networks or GANs in short. And um, yeah, um, so some of you um, have proposed uh, continuing this kind of format when we asked you about uh, improvements in the midterm um, survey. And so, well, I hope you enjoy that uh, day. Uh, Luis will cover um, the, the second half of the lecture. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. And I think we should get right, in, uh, uh, get right uh, into it. Yeah, let's do that. All righty. So um, previously we have been talking about machine learning models that are supposed to map you know, some high dimensional data space to some more abstract um, low dimensional function space. So classification of images, right? Images are, you know, many hundreds of thousands or millions of pixels. And we map these to maybe thousand or less um, classes, dogs and cats and all these things. You know? And today, we will present something that you've heard last week uh, when Max introduced you to variational autoencoders, uh, namely exactly the opposite direction of, of, of a mapping, right? So you have a low dimensional data, uh, sorry, uh, latent space, and then you map to images or any high dimensional or whatever dimensional uh, sample, yeah? And, um, so when we say we want to generate realistic data, we always mean that the model that we train should match the data distribution as well as, as possible. Yeah? So the real underlying data um, here is you know, typically given as a data set of, of many, many samples in our uh, generative model should now, in whatever way uh, we will see later, uh, map to to this, let's say, shape. But it's not just the shape of the distribution, it's also the density. Yeah? So think, for example, of a data set uh, that has uh, many canines, so it could, could have a mode uh, consisting of all the dogs and another mode it has all the wolves and foxes and coyotes and all these other uh, canines. Yeah. So, what we really want here is not just the shape of the distribution. We just we also want you know some of those uh, samples to appear more often. Yeah. This reminds me of the lecture of last week with the vari uh, variation autoencoders, where we also had these modes for the so for the MNIST variation autoencoder, where we also had the modes for the different digits and they exactly. would all clump together in the total distribution exactly. of the data that we want to have. Right, and you can think of this in a, you know, a one-dimensional world. Let's say uh, we, we have our density given here uh, as, a, as a blue line, right? And this is what we want to match. But the thing is, we don't want to match uh, uh, or we don't want our model to learn uh, you know, an explicit like like an equation of this of this density, you know, this um, you know is all based on samples. So we have our data set with many many samples, and also our generator generates one sample at a time, right? So mm -hmm. by running this generator over and over again, we'll populate this space, and then uh, you know we can we can match this this distribution. And an example of um, such a generative model, uh, and I, I mentioned that earlier, is uh, the variational autoencoder or, um, you know, variants of this. And we, we looked at this and uh, I invite you to visit Wojciech Mo's uh, page here. Uh, you'll find code on how to generate these faces, which by the way, you notice uh, look all a little blurry. That's something that uh, VAEs uh, often uh, produce. There are a couple of things that you could do about that, but we'll not cover this in this lecture. But uh, for now, this is a generative model that we have already uh, looked at. And in future lectures, 
uh, we'll look at not just images, we'll look at uh, how to generate um, realistic sequences and text could be, you know, um, a, a domain that you like working in. And uh, we'll look at recurrent uh, neural networks and also uh, transformers. Uh, but this is something for the future or for the near future. I would have almost believed that this is a text from Shakespeare until I saw the clown speaking. <laughs> the clown, yeah. Yeah, that's a bit weird for a work of Shakespeare, but okay. Yeah. Uh, you should actually visit the site. Um, um, so this is, this is, I think, you know, a famous blog post uh, from uh, Andre Carpathy. Um, it, it's really, really uh, well written. I think uh, uh, you'll, you'll enjoy reading that. Mm. So, but the generative model for today is called generative adversarial network. So GANs have been proposed uh, in 2014, so six, seven years ago. Uh, Ian Goodfellow was the, the, the first author on this paper. And, and we'll look at this paper, at the specific formulation of again uh, today, but after uh, its initial uh, formulation, uh, many, many papers, many researchers uh, have taken up this idea and uh, have proposed many very cool GAN variants. And um, so, you know, uh, especially phase generation has seen an, a remarkable development, you know, starting from like, you know, uh, gray value pictures like cropped uh, very, very, very densely here. And then, you know, very low resolution up to color. And then, you know, I, I would say even like eerie realism here. Yeah. So this mm -hmm. isn't an actual person. Uh, and uh, please visit this person does not exist.com and you'll you'll be able to generate a couple of uh, faces that you don't believe are actually fake. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this is even two years ago, right? So style again two uh, is already two years ago. I think mm -hmm. I think there's still a lot of uh, progress to be seen. Yeah. Um, by the way, faces of obviously aren't the, the only thing that you can uh, generate. Uh, you know, for example, here in this 2017 paper of uh, people from NVIDIA, uh, you, you can see bedrooms, right? Or you can even um, condition the output on, an, on a user input, right? So you, you draw a sketch of, of a burst or, um, or, or shoes or whatever, a rucksack, and then the, and then the generator will come up with his imagination of how this thing would look in, in reality. Doesn't look as cool as the faces though. <laughs> Not yet at least. Yeah, I mean, I think especially with GANs, uh, you know, creating um, a way uh, so you can control the output is really a big challenge. and. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we'll like in, at the very end of this lecture, we'll see one of the many tricks that you can do in a work that we have done. Um, but yeah, so I think, I think there's uh, still ample room for, for research. Um, yeah. To conclude this general overview uh, about GANs, uh, I decided to show you uh, the GAN Zoo, which is a GitHub page uh, of Hindu Paravinash. And uh, he has uh, tracked all the publications in this field. And as you can see, the, the number of publications, uh, you know, uh, uh, was rising exponentially. I think uh, he stopped tracking it uh, last year or two years ago. Uh, but I mean, we're well beyond 500 or 700, I don't know, uh, hundreds of, of, of GANs. And the original paper has been cited. Uh, uh, I don't know, 30,000 times or something. Yeah, so, so this is really, so GANs are really a landmark um, contribution to the machine learning field. And you should know about how this works. So this is a paper. Um, we will uh, look at some of the main ideas here. Um, Oh yeah, 20, 27,000 times. So maybe this number is a little older. No, no, it may be a little higher. 
Um, and it has been used to generate MNIST, um, so uh, handwritten digits and, and faces and some, some more and you'll see uh, now how this works. Okay, so this is an example uh, that people usually come up with to, to, uh, to you know, exemplify what's going on in GAN training. So think of um, GAN training as an adversarial game between a bad guy and a good guy. <laughs> it could be you know, any guy, but you know, it makes it easier to think of this as, as a bad guy and, and, and a good guy. So obviously the good guys wear glasses. Obviously. Now, now, who guessed who made this, this, these slides or this, 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 uh, this, uh, this, this slide, this, the specific slide? <clears throat> no idea. Yeah, 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 I know. Okay, so, so let me, let me be the, the bad guy and Luis is this guy. So I, my, my goal is to uh, produce fake uh, money. Yeah? So bills that appear as realistic as possible, indistinguishable, from real money, yeah? And Luis's task is to, uh, to inspect these. And, you know, he doesn't know uh, that it comes from, from me, the counterfeiter, uh, or from a regular, you know, valid source and has to learn, okay, what are the features that this fake money exhibits, right? So in the, in the beginning, I may not be able to, to produce perfect bills, obviously uh, I'm a bad guy. I, I can also learn from my mistakes and then I, I'll get better and better. So this really is an iterative game, right? So I start generating uh, money and this money, so let's say the blue uh, money is the fake money and the real, the green uh, money is uh, coming Luis's way. And his task now is to sort uh, you know, the good ones in the good bucket and the bad ones in the bad bucket. And by sorting out fake bills as fake, I can learn uh, what to do better, right? Because I don't have to, I don't have to uh, improve bills that uh, Louis was unable to identify as fake. No. But from those samples, I gave him that he was able to reject. I can learn, okay, maybe that one was a bad one. Let's, let's improve this one. And how to improve? Well, GANs have a specific way of knowing that. Uh, you know, counterfeiters uh, don't have such a direct correspondence between uh, police uh, or expert rejections of their art <laughs> uh, and how to improve this. Um, mm -hmm. But like the, the idea is clear. Now, uh, continuing this iteration, um, the generator or the bad guy, me, um, at some point reaches this level where um, the discriminator, uh, Luis, can really tell fake from, from real, right? So we have a uniform distribution um, of, of what he says is fake in real and actual fakes and reals. Now I understand why you wanted to be the bad guy. It's because you win in the end, right? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, in real world, that probably, you know, leads to new, I don't know, money printing machines on the state side yeah. <laughs> and me losing my game. And so, and also, uh, you know, it's illegal. So <clears throat> maybe yeah. I'm not, uh, not on, the, on the best uh, side of the story. But I think this, this idea is, is really um, a good example of how, to, of how to explain GANs, yeah? So in the end, the counterfeiter, so the de generator learns uh, the, the distribution, right? The data distribution of what is real, although the generator has not seen real money explicitly, right? It, it only knows about what's real and what's not through the feedback of uh, the discriminator. Let's look at this more formally. So the objective, as, as we said, is uh, um, the discriminator, so Luis, the good guy, needs, uh, gets samples um, from either uh, the data distribution or the distribution that the generator uh, 
um, produces. And the objective now is to distinguish real samples from fake samples. Yeah, so it receives these and puts out in the original formulation just a scalar value between zero and one. One meaning, you know, this is, um, this is a real uh, sample and zero uh, meaning this is, a, this is a fake, but you know, usually this is between zero and, and one. So, you know, the value 0 0.1 probably uh, means this is a probably a fake sample and um, an output of 0.9 means this is probably a real, a real sample. Looking at the bad guy, the generator, um, the, his object or its objective is to approximate the real distribution. Yeah. So again, we don't have a, a direct access to P data. Um, we'll generate this distribution Q um, and this should match P data. We, um, so in order to produce samples that aren't always the same, but, you know, um, fall in a, in a, you know, in a range of, of different uh, um, outputs, we'll, we will feed the generator random inputs. Yeah, so for, for example, here we have uh, a Gaussian um, uh, probability distribution and we sample from this um, um, our inputs. And we call these inputs Z. And this distribution normally is, is a very simple uh, distribution, could be normal, could be uniform, right? In the, I think in the, in the original paper, uh, in the 2014 paper, they even used a uniform distribution. And this input then is transformed, upsampled mostly, um, to match the output dimensionality of our real data, right? So if we think of images, uh, we will come up with, uh, you know, width by height by depth uh, tensor here, but uh, really the, the GAN framework works for uh, also non-image domains. And again, uh, sampling different Zs will, uh, will, you know, lead to the generator generating uh, a distribution of, of samples, okay? So let's put everything together. So we have the discriminator and we have the generator. Uh, the discriminator receives data that we call X and fake data that we call X tilde. And oh, by the way, this looks as though, as, as if the discriminator has, you know, separate channels for each input. Uh, mm -hmm. whether, whether it's real or fake, it, it's not the case, right? It's, it doesn't know where the data is coming from. It doesn't use separate or uh, 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 yeah, separate channels. It just mm -hmm. gets an image and then has to uh, produce an output. And uh, if this image is a fake um, um, sample, it is produced by G and G is again, as I said before, fed a random um, sample Z, right? So Z could be, um, could be, I don't know, low dimensional as 10 or 32 or 64 dimensions could also be a little, little bigger, but usually isn't that big. All right. Okay. So now how do we train this, this system? First, uh, let's have a look at what the objective is for D and G and how can we um, put this into equations. So we said that the discriminator should um, classify or should, um, uh, yeah, should result in values close to zero when or if the input to it was a fake sample and should do the opposite. So result in a one if the input was real sample. Conversely, the, the, the generator's objective is to produce data that the discriminator incorrectly for the discriminator, but you know, uh, rightly for the generator, 
um, tells uh, to be true, to be real. Yeah? So D of X tilde is one and X tilde is the output of the generator. So D of G of Z is one in the optimal case for, uh, for the generator. Hmm. Yeah, and now you see um, exactly uh, that this is an adversarial game. Yeah? So one objective for the, for the discriminator says D of the fake should be zero and exactly the opposite is the objective for the generator. Right? And so, um, yeah, so we can, we can like combine those two objectives in the top into one when we say, okay, let's just maximize this expression. Yeah, so D of X, so the, the discriminator output of, of a real sample should be one. So um, if we maximize this term and, and maximize this term as well, uh, that's equivalent to what we've just said before. Yeah? So D is for, for a fake input should be zero and one minus zero uh, maximizes this subterm here and uh, would maximize the, the entire term here. Now- What about the generator objective? Yeah, let's have a look at the generator. Um, oh, wait, uh, what did I do here? Uh, oh yeah, and usually we will um, use uh, log likelihoods, yeah? So, because this makes, uh, this makes the numbers a little more handy and doesn't change the, the, the location in parameter space where this, um, this uh, objective is met, yeah? This also looks a lot like binary cross entropy. It does, does it? And I know you when you prepared uh, the slides, you you had a different way of, of approaching this from the from the binary cross entropy. And I thought um, maybe we could just uh, build it up like this. But yeah, if if you notice um, this, uh, you're right. This so this is this is very similar to the to the cross entropy uh, loss formulation. Uh, now let's continue this for the generator. Um, obviously we could re rewrite this as maximum of uh, D of the fake X or a maximum where log of D uh, uh, of log of D of X tilde. But um, we, you know, um, to uh, express uh, that this is an adversarial game, we just use exactly this part here, but not maximize it. We want to minimize this, right? So the objective of the generator is to minimize something that the discriminator now wants to maximize. And then there's something, uh, namely this part here, where the discriminator gets real samples. That's something that the generator doesn't really care about. You know? So information about how the discriminator uh, classifies real data uh, is not used for the optimization of the generator. Good. Now let's have a look at how this works. Um, so we have like a global loop, right? Our iterations. Um, and then we have a sub loop. And I think in the paper it was, so K was one or two. So this could be a low number. Hmm. And this, this sub loop here corresponds to training the discriminator and outside on the next uh, slide, we'll train the generator. Now it works like this. So three main steps. We first sample mini batches from the real distribution, which is our database, right? So we take, let's, mm -hmm. say, let's say images, from the real database, uh, m many, and also m many from the generator. Yeah? So we feed it m many different random samples z, and then obtain m many uh, x tildes. Now we feed these into the discriminator, and uh, you know. Um, kind of store what the output was. And now we can compute um, our, our loss and backprop 
this the gradient of the loss into the discriminator. So I hope you remember that already. So the loss gradient is uh, for a certain configuration of the parameters of D, uh, a vector that points upwards, right? So if we had uh, our discriminator at a, at a certain weight and bias uh, setting, yeah, and feed our, our images in and compute uh, our loss or the loss derivative, and then backprop this into the into all of these parameters, we will obtain a change for each of these parameters that increases the loss. Yeah. So usually in, in network training, we walk uh, minus the gradient, so in the opposite direction, because we want to minimize the loss. But this loss here, uh, if you remember the, the, the previous slides, needs to be maximized. So it's not really a loss. It's, it's nothing. Uh, so if, if high, high values aren't bad here, right? So we want to obtain the uh, maximum. I get it. So um, the generator, and uh, no, sorry, the discriminator wants to maximize the loss of the generator, so to speak, because it wants the generator to be wrong yeah. and itself to be right. Yeah, Makes exactly, sense. right? So this part uh, is exactly what you said. It wants to minimize uh, the, the money, let's say, that the generator ca can successfully keep in circulation. And now, after these uh, few steps of uh, making the discriminator better, we uh, get out of this, this inner loop here uh, into this global loop. And we sample again a mini batch for uh, of uh, of fake samples, and then we do the same like before. We feed these samples into the discriminator and compute the loss gradient and backpropagate. And now we don't backpropagate these into the parameters of D. We backpropagate this further into G. Yeah, so we obtain a gradient vector or gradient matrices for each of these layers in, in G that now um, are not applied into, the, into you know, maximizing this, this, this objective. We walk uh, the opposite direction to minimize um, this, this loss. Yeah, so the, the discriminator uh, having seen a fake sample uh, should produce a one or something close to one, right? So that this expression is minimized. So walking downhill ensures that the next time we generate something, you know, using the parameters that are in G, um, uh, that the next time the sample looks more realistic and the, the discriminator will have a, have a harder time uh, classifying this as fake. So G and D take turns in the training. Exactly. Yeah, so the first loop here trains D and the second part here down, down uh, after this uh, f first uh, um, section trains G. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now you see this, this is a, this is a weird kind of uh, uh, training. I mean, Basically, this isn't such a hard thing to understand, right? So uh, pass it samples that are right and, and wrong, and then, you know, let's, let's optimize this, and then pass it again, uh, fake samples, and then optimize the generator. But these are vastly different tasks. Yeah? So discriminating something uh, is much easier than generating something. Uh, you know, if you think of, um, 1 million pixels and, uh, you know, you are the generator and you have to define the value of each of these pixels. Well, I mean, you will have a hard time finding the, the proper configuration for each of these pixels. I mean, the, the way a, uh, a generator is usually built, um, you know, uh, um, 
uh, how do you say that, uh, introduces uh, so-called uh, inductive bias, right? So the, the architecture itself enables or, or simplifies this generation process, but still it is um, much, uh, much harder to generate something real or realistic uh, than to just say, ah, wrong, right, wrong, yeah? And now, and, and the cool thing here, please remember that, uh, which is different from the way the police operates probably. Um, by using backpropagation, we have direct access to how to change the parameters of G to fool the discriminator. Yeah, because everything is connected in this computational graph. We know exactly how to change the parameters to um, fool the discriminator. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, the results. So for, for MNIST, uh, it's pretty clear uh, it works, yeah? So you see this matrix here of, of samples. Let me just switch to my uh, laser pointer here. So uh, these are generated images. And in this last row, uh, sorry, last column, you see samples that then have been matched, uh, you know, uh, via, uh, via nearest neighbor um, um, in, in the database. And so this is the, the nearest sample that could be found. And you see that this downstroke here of this nine doesn't look like, uh, like the downstroke of this uh, generated sample. And so we are pretty sure that uh, the model, the generator doesn't learn samples by heart. And the same is true for, for faces. The GAN captures pretty, pretty much uh, you know, all those facial features that we expect uh, to be in a face. Sometimes it looks a little, little odd, but uh, you know, generally I think uh, handwritten digits and faces um, you know, can safely be said uh, we can generate this with this vanilla GAN uh, formulation. And uh, I put this here because we had this in the VAE lecture. Um, you can also interpolate in Z-space and generate different samples. So take two random points in Z-space and then walk linearly from one point to the other. Yeah? So for example, uh, you know, start in Z-space that corresponds to a one and then go, go, go over to uh, the point in Z-space that corresponds to a, to a five or from a seven to a one. And you see that um, those intermediary Z positions uh, do correspond to, you know, reasonable, sensible kind of uh, samples here. Yeah? So um, that means the Z space is really then densely packed with meaningful um, samples. This looks really nice for uh, MNIST data set, but uh, I wonder what happens when you take uh, more complex problems. Yeah, I, I wonder if you had a look at my slides yet, uh, uh, before that. And you're right. Um, <laughs> so, you know, faces and those uh, handwritten digits are really, you know, uh, either uh, very easy or highly structured. So faces, for example, are uh, pretty much always the same, right, with, with slight variations. And then if you look at like boats and, uh, and horses and all these things, you know, in one entire data set, that's a lot of, you know, really complex structure. And, uh, and at least this, uh, you know, initial GAN paper, the original GAN paper, uh, didn't really do a good job here. Yeah, and, but that's okay. Because, you know, in science, we show what we can do and also, you know, don't hide what we cannot do. And then the community takes this up uh, as a challenge. And then this is, this is how we evolve. This is how we get better and improve. Okay. You know, this actually doesn't even look that, uh, that awful in comparison to what I'm about to show you now. Uh, let me just share my screen with you. So. Yeah. Um, so what you're seeing here is um, an example for a gun training where the uh, where we tried to map uh, a uniform dist uh, distribution to a Gaussian one D distribution. Uh, I took this from. Uh, let me also switch uh, my pointer. 
to a laser pointer. I took this from uh, this uh, towards data science uh, post. And um, this is pretty much the most simple problem you can imagine, right? Um, just take a 1D uniform distribution and try to map it to a uniform, uh, sorry, to a 1D Gaussian, such as mm -hmm. this one. And well, you can see to, uh, the, the red area is the distribution that the gun is learning while, the, uh, while it's training. You can see that um, the gun is having quite some problems trying to approximate this very simple distribution and well, this is quite a problem, right? Because um, if we can't uh, get a stable training for problems that are as simple as this one, uh, how can we do that for more complex distributions uh, and more complex problems? And um, maybe um, an interesting question is why do we even have this kind of instability uh, even for simple problems? And well, the uh, underlying problem for this basically is the uh, min-max optimization problem that uh, you already talked about. Uh, so in your slides, I think you already uh, you only had this as max of uh, this expression that looks a bit like uh, binary cross entropy for uh, the discriminator and minimum uh, or minimizing this expression for the generator. So if we formulate this as an optimization problem for both generator and the discriminator, uh, well, we have this min-max optimization. And um, obviously, we have two opposing forces here. The generator is trying to do the opposite with the loss that the discriminator is trying to do. And since we have opposing forces, uh, this is a very difficult problem to optimize. And if we think of this as a is an abstract representation in a phase space, let's say a one-dimensional case where we have one parameter for the generator, one parameter for the discriminator, our loss landscape would maybe look somewhat like this. And we'd want to find uh, settled points such as this point, which are, uh, let me show this in a bit more detail. So uh, these settled points, which are what we want to have are uh, local maxima for uh, for the discriminator and local minima for the generator. And well, if you imagine this as a physical landscape, obviously it would be really easy to slide down from the saddle and it would be hard to settle on this particular point. And pretty much all the problems that guns have stem from there. Um, so we have no convergence guarantee uh, because um, it's, well, we can't guarantee that uh, we are going to reach some kind of equilibrium with our training. Um, another problem due to this uh, complex nature of the uh, min-max optimization problem is that we have long convergence times for the guns. And um, well, this other problem, um, criticizing is easy. So um, I think this is something which also matches our real life intuition basically. Um, if you think, for example, of criticizing movies, it's much easier to uh, criticize a movie than to actually generate a movie. This also applies, in a sense, to the uh, to, to, to the gener to the gun problem domain because the discriminator has an easier time uh, criticizing the uh, co the contents that the uh, generator is producing than uh, the generator actually producing those contents and capturing the variance of the data set. And well, this leads to problems because if the, for the discriminator, it's really easy to reach optimality. And once it has done that, the generator does not get any learning signal and this uh, undermines the whole training process. So we need to pay attention to having equally powerful discriminator and generator or equally powerful actors. And this also contributes to uh, reducing uh, or to to making the training unstable. Then we have this other problem, uh, which is called uh, mode collapse or dropping, which is also a really big issue uh, with guns. So um, picking up again the MNIST problem that you talked about earlier, Tim, um, you know, uh, here uh, we can see how the distribution uh, of the, the generated samples progresses over training. This is uh, something that, uh, this is basically a good training where we end up with something that we would like to have. 
So you can see that we cover the entire variance of that data set uh, because we are generating ones and uh, zeros and twos, and we are uh, generating all those digits that our MDES data set has, so all the modes, so to say, of our distribution. And the results are also looking like uh, actual numbers from the original data set. But uh, with guns, something that often happens is that um, well, we get a mode collapse. So all of, uh, all of the modes that we want to have collapse into one single mode. And then we basically have zero variance for the generated uh, data sample. So all the data samples you can see here look the same and they don't even look anything like digits. So um, we have two problems here. On the one hand, our, we don't have those different modes of the distribution. So we have a low extra mode uh, variance, so to speak. And even within that mode that we capture, the variance is also uh, basically zero. And yeah, this is really a problem because now we're not generating samples from a distribution, we're just generating one single sample. And that's not what we want to achieve with our GANs. Um, and let me maybe give you an intuition why this uh, mode collapse problem uh, appears. Uh, so this is one possible mechanism of uh, multiple uh, mechanisms that could appear, but I think this is a very intuitive mechanism that gives you an intuition of how this can happen. Um, so we can basically, the idea for this example is that um, we can have tough luck and our generator can uh, produce um, a number of samples which have a low variance. So in this case, you can see the generator has produced three ones that all look very similar and one six. And now the generator pass or the, the, the discriminator receives these samples. And as usual, it tries to categorize them as true or fake since the ones are um, more uh, present or more represented in these samples than any other uh, modes or any other digits. And many of those are going to be classified by the discriminator as true. And some also as fake, of course, but some are probably going to end up being classified as true. And well, since they aren't actually true, the discriminator is going to, or the weight of the discriminator are going to be optimized. So the uh, so it focuses more on the ones next time because it can easily improve its performance by focusing on all these samples that were misclassified uh, or yeah, misclassified and not recognized as uh, fake samples. So our discriminator uh, gets better on discriminating the ones, but this is a problem the next time for the next optimization step of the generator because now if the generator produces a next sample, maybe not uh, with an over representation of ones and feeds this to the discriminator. The discriminator is ready for this, so to speak, because it has uh, been optimized to focus on uh, the features appearing in the ones. And so most of those ones that uh, were produced by the generator are probably going to be end up classified as fake and this is going to uh, send a signal, a learning signal to the generator that it should improve on the ones in order to increase its performance. So it's also going to focus on features uh, that fake ones should have. And now we're in a feedback loop, right? Because the discriminator is trying to focus on discriminating ones. The generator is focusing on improving generated ones. And yeah, we just keep uh, turning around in this feedback loop until uh, basically all the all the variants disappear because we are only focusing on very specific um, properties of it them. It sounds very unstable, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Like, like it's bal balancing, I don't know, uh, something, uh, I mean, so, so many different balls, like for the modes, uh, keep them in balance, kind uh, yeah, seems to be a kind of really hard problem. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that picture, by the way. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much what's happening, I, I suppose. Um, and uh, we also have another problem, um, which is called oscillatory behavior. Actually, this is very similar to uh, one of the previous problems that or it's also related to the uh, slow convergence of guns. 
but so we not only have slow convergence, but we might not have any convergence at all because we get stuck in infinite loops uh, around periodic trajectories. Uh, so here I set up a simple example uh, to uh, give you an intuition of how this could happen. So for this very simple function, theta d times theta g, um, we, and with, uh, for a learning rate of two that I set up for this example to work, um, let us do a couple of optimization steps. Um, so here, this is the uh, theta d, this is, uh, the, this is a single discriminator parameter, and this is the single generator parameter. Now, if we do the first um, step, uh, the parameters of the generator get updated to a minus one. So we end up with this state minus one minus one in the phase space. Now we continue with an update step of the discriminator, which sends my uh, new state up here. So th these would be my new uh, weights. And now we repeat this. And as you can see, after four iterations, we are right back where we started. And since all the, uh, since uh, all parameters are the same as at the beginning. Uh, we're just going to repeat this trajectory again the next time we repeat this. And well, if this can happen with uh, such simple systems, uh, there is no reason to believe that this can also happen with more uh, complex generators and discriminators. It might even be more probable to end up with loops like this. So how do we solve those problems? Uh, first of all, uh, let us address the oscillatory behavior problem. And for this, uh, there's a method of dealing with it that's called historical averaging. So in the example that I showed you, um, our generator was always moving in this loop. So the idea that we might have is, okay, so uh, if the cell point is somewhere in the center of that loop, let us try to create a force that drags the, the weight or the, the trajectory towards that, uh, towards that center. And that's precisely what we do. So we penalize deviations from the weight average in a temporal environment or a neighborhood. And we do that by keeping track of a running average as we do with lots of optimization uh, algorithms such as Aiden, for example. Um, so we keep track of this running average and now um, let us say that uh, we are at a point uh, theta t in our training. Uh, so this is the current state and we have um, followed this trajectory. So if we computed the mean of all those points along the trajectory, this might be the, the resulting mean. And now we subtract our current state from that mean and take the norm and add this as a penalty, uh, penalty sorry, to our, uh, to our normal loss of the gun. So this acts as a regularizing force that it's going to um, draw the, our state theta t towards uh, this average. And as a result, our, our state or our, um, yeah, the succession of states in our training is going to spiral towards uh, this uh, average that we calculated. And well, obviously this leads to a faster convergence because we can't get stuck in infinite loops anymore. We're going to uh, uh, move into that spiral sooner or early, uh, earlier or later. And we're also going to end up with less oscillations. Um, then there's uh, the mode collapse problem. So this is actually the biggest problem of guns. And um, how do we address that? Um, one possibility is uh, one-sided label smoothing. The idea for this is really simple and it's remarkable that this even works. So the idea is, um, remember the problem was that uh, our discriminator can specialize on a few features and this will allow it to do a high confidence discrimination. And well, we didn't want that to happen because uh, focusing on few features is bad and co causes the whole mechanism that we discussed. So what we need to do is we need to reduce the confidence of D for those predictions. And we do that by training D with smooth labels. So um, we set an alpha, for example, 0 0.9, and we tell the discriminator uh, basically anytime the discriminator is too confident and returns a score of say one. So if the discriminator is sure, 
that the that uh, this is a fake, then we're going to punish the discriminator because uh, it's it has uh, too high a confidence and it deviates from 0 0.9. So we do that simply by incorporating these smooth labels uh, instead of ones. And yeah, that uh, is a possible mechanism for mitigating mode collapse. Uh, another possibility, which also has other practical applications, is using C guns, so conditional guns. And the idea here, um, I'm not sure we did this for variational autoencoders. So uh, there, there's also yeah. C base, so the conditional variational autoencoders. Uh, yeah, I think we didn't do it, but uh, anyway, if you read about those um, on your additional studies, um, it's, we're doing pretty much the same as for conditional variation autoencoders here. And what we're doing is simply adding some labels uh, that we provide to the discriminator and to the generator. So if you think of the MNIST example, um, instead of just passing the, uh, the, uh, the true data here, so the, the, the real samples, we would also pass a label Y, which tells us uh, what digit that uh, sample is. And for the generator, we wouldn't just uh, sample noise, but we would also sample uh, a Y, so a label that tells me what digit that a noise should be mapped to. And this helps us get control of uh, over the latent space, essentially, and also um, impedes uh, this mode collapse from happening because it's uh, more easy to get a structured latent space now rather than one where everything just uh, collapses into one mode. Yeah, that kind of make, makes sense, right? But uh, you, you need those labels. And if you, if you don't have any labels and you can't use that, uh, uh, that approach, right? So for example, um, uh, we had a project in which we generated faces and there was simply no label for, um, for, uh, for background, for example. So we had mode collapse um, uh, and, and we saw that uh, the background was always black or always white or so. Uh, and so the, it was yeah. hard to, it would, would have been hard to use this kind of approach there. Yeah, sure. So not obviously, not all these approaches work anywhere, but um, there, there are ways of dealing with uh, some of these problems, yeah. Um, and uh, actually it's interesting you mentioned this now because um, there's also more, more universal ways of dealing with this problem. So we don't have to add information to our problem in order to deal with this uh, mode collapse problem. We can also just try to modify our loss function in some way. And um, let us try to understand how we need to do that to address our problem. So um, remember the problem is that the loss function only um, uh, only rewards uh, the discriminator or it rewards the generator for fooling the discriminator, but it doesn't reward the uh, discriminator for uh, producing data that looks similar uh, to the original data. It simply has to fool the discriminator, never mind what that data looks like. And if our discriminator has bad uh, discrimination uh, uh, criteria, well, our obviously our, gener uh, this, uh, our generator can do pretty much anything it likes uh, simply, to, uh, simply to reach this goal of fooling the discriminator. So we need to come up with a different loss that also uh, is in some way correlated to the quality of the samples that the generator is producing. And how can we do this? Uh, this is actually a problem which was addressed by the so-called Wasserstein guns. And uh, the idea was to replace the discriminator, which simply produces an output from zero to one with a critic that outputs uh, more of a score uh, that gives us a feeling of how good the, uh, the output of the generator is. And that's only the first step. So the, the first step is replace the discriminator, which uh, outputs uh, these, this from a value from zero to one with a critic with, uh, yeah, with a pre-critic. And then the second part is trying to minimize the distribution distance between the 
original data P data and our generated data G of PC. And now if you remember the variation autoencoder lecture, you might think, oh, okay, I know something that measures the distance between two distributions, which is the KL divergence. So why not use that to um, incorporate a, panel, a penalty for um, a deviation between those two data sets? But that's actually not how we do it. So we use a so-called earth mover distance instead, which also makes sense uh, if you look at what we are writing here. So we're taking the expectation value of uh, the discriminator for data sampled from the real distribution minus the expectation value of the discriminator for the generated samples. And this makes sense now because we're not producing, uh, we're not producing a fakeness score anymore. Uh, or, sorry, we're not producing a probability of being right anymore. We're producing more of a, a score that can take any value we, we like. So if these two expectation values are similar, it tells us that uh, the distribution that is generated is similar to the distribution that we have over the real data. And there's actually a bit more theory behind this, which also explains why this uh, distribution is called, uh, or yeah, why this loss or distance measure is called earth mover distance. Um, maybe let me just quickly explain why we call this earth mover distance. So the underlying idea is that we have two distributions of earth, let's say, which are called a P of X and Q of Y here over common space. So for this example, let's assume we're in the Minecraft world where we have positions one, two, three, and four uh, for P of X and here, so for P of Y over Y, also one, two, three, four. And we have this pile of earth and this, we want to transform this pile of earth into this other pile of earth. And in order to do that, we need to find some redistribution function, which I'm going to call gamma of y and uh, gamma of x and y. And gamma of x and y tells me how much mass I need to shift from a value x to y. So for example, from one to three. And then we're going to compute a distance uh, or a cost for that redistribution. So for this example, let's say that each earth block has a mass of one and the cost of shifting earth mass from X to one is the distance of that shift times the mass. So for this example, we could have this redistribution function, for instance, where um, for one, so for a shift from one to two, we're going to move two blocks of earth and then from four to three, we're also going to shift two blocks of earth. And I think it's pretty clear that if you do that, you end up with this distribution. And well, for everything else, we have zero. So now if we think about that cost function, uh, we sum over all possible x, y, the, this would be 16 possible cases. But since most of those are zero, we just have uh, two times one. So for shifting from one to two, the distance is one and we multiply it with two, which is the mass. And the same for this case. So for shifting from four to three, we also have a distance of one and we shift two blocks of mass. So we end up with a full uh, cost of four. But um, Luis, I can imagine many different uh, redistribution functions. Precisely, right? exactly. And that's precisely the problem here. So I gave you one specific distribution uh, redistribution function with this particular cost, but we could have many different redistribution functions. And the distribution redistribution function that we want to have is the one which gives you the least cost or the smallest cost. So we want to end up with the minimal possible expected redistribution cost. So we need to compute the, uh, the infimum over all possible distributions. Uh, that's a tough one, right? <laughs> that's, yeah, it's absolutely a tough one. And in fact, it's so for this example, you could do this uh, uh, just by trying out all possible combinations. But if you don't even have uh, a finite uh, distribution, so if you, I don't know, have maybe a continuous uh, probability distribution, this is a 
completely untractable problem. And so we need to apply some tricks. And uh, you notice that this also doesn't look anything like the loss that we had earlier. And this is because if we apply some further tricks here, we'll talk about those in the, in the um, not in the assignments, but in the QA lecture, if you're interested, uh, you can actually end up with this instead. Okay, so maybe to uh, just sum this up briefly, um, how the V-Gun or the Wasserstein gun is uh, better than the gun. Uh, let's just go through these uh, three points. So first of all, uh, the, due to the formulation of the loss function, we no longer get vanishing gradients for the generator, even if the critic has reached optimality. So remember, this was a problem that we had with a normal gun. And th this uh, was a trigger for the mode collapse that we talked about. And the second um, thing that has changed is that our loss function now correlates with the quality of the generated samples, which we also saw because it's no longer, we're no longer just saying, okay, I'm fooling the discriminator, so I, I get a reward. But now um, we are also uh, capturing this correlation between uh, the two distributions. Okay, so now you've learned about two different kinds of uh, generative models, namely about variational autoencoders that you saw in the last lecture, and uh, generative adversarial networks in this one. And now you might ask the question, okay, uh, what kind of model should I use if I have a generative problem? And well, the answer is it depends on the kind of problem that you have, right? So variational autoencoders, uh, let me just quickly... Uh, so my pointer, as a variational autoencoders have the advantage that they're easy to train, but as you saw in the last lecture, they usually come up with blurry images. And uh, so this is not a problem that we have with a gun, on the other hand, where we typically have high image quality, but uh, guns are usually difficult to train. So yeah, we have a clear trade-off between these two models and depending on what you want to have for your uh, problem, you should use the respective model. Maybe we should mention that uh, there's like a ton of different variants of uh, variational autoencoders in GANs, obviously. And, um, mm -hmm. but, but obviously we can't cover all those things. And, uh, um, but yeah, I, I think like generally what, so for the original formulations, of VAEs and, and GANs, this is uh, absolutely true. Yeah, I think it also applies to most uh, of the modifications actually. So it's an open yeah. research question, uh, trying to make variation autoencoders as performant as uh, guns and conversely making guns as stable in training as uh, variation autoencoders. But so there have been improvements in that regard, but uh, there's still this gap that needs to be closed between both model architectures. Okay, so um, comparing properties of GANs and VAEs is something that uh, also these people here have uh, recently done in this paper. Um, they have created a data set so these many, many points that, um, you know, follow this kind of uh, bimodal sinusoidal uh, structure. And then they have trained, you know, very simple GAN and a very, very simple VAE um, that use a one dimensional uh, latent. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. the, so, so the data lives in two dimensions, um, but the latent is only one dimension. And so what the VAE does is, you know, something that pretty much corresponds to what we see when we see those blurry uh, images. Um, it kind of learns uh, the average through these two uh, modes of, of sine waves. And um, so the color here along this line uh, reflects the latent value, right? So mm -hmm. um, it nicely, you know, matches this, this, this space, but um, you know, most of the time doesn't really give a good representation of those real uh, data points. Now, GANs, and this was, uh, I think, in the vanilla formulation that we that, that we uh, just introduced, uh, they kind of match um, modes here, but then jump 
to to other modes and jump back, right? So um, obviously, you know, in one dimension, uh, you can represent this kind of more complex structure, but the GAN is better able to represent uh, realistic data, right? Non-blurry uh, data. Ah, yeah, cool. That uh, ties in really nicely to the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, so, and, yeah. Also, and also, so those people don't just show how uh, GANs and VAEs uh, learn this kind of synthetic data. They propose a kind of hybrid uh, architecture. So they call this adversarial uh, VAEs or AVAEs. Um, so basically VAEs that, that uh, are trained in this adversarial manner. Um, so I highly recommend this paper. Um, yeah, it looks really interesting. I didn't know that, by the way. Thanks for pointing this out. Th so. Thanks for Twitter to <laughs> show me that paper. Yeah. I just found thanks it a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I think the last part of this lecture should focus on how to validate GANs. Um, remember, we don't have you know, labels. Most of the time, this is an unsupervised learning uh, process. And also the loss function, um, the generator loss, doesn't necessarily give us a good estimate of how realistic those samples look. Mm -hmm. uh, and why is that? Well, I mean, think of the discriminator. Um, you know, it may have found um, features that do not correspond to those that humans use, right? So in, in the image domain, um, it, it could have found, I don't know, some noise patterns or so imperceptible to humans, but, um, you know, that are actually found in the real data set. And the generator could just re re reproduce those kind of noise patterns and we wouldn't, we would know because the, the loss is perfect. And, yeah. and so that doesn't necessarily, you know, mean the generator is good. So, but how do we uh, validate uh, the samples that the generator uh, spits out? Um, to be honest, this is really an open research question. So I'm gonna give you only a couple of things that uh, people use. Uh, there's a broad range of other things that you can do. Uh, I think this is just the minimum of what you should be aware of. So the first thing that you do is you always obviously visually inspect samples and you can do that also with samples that are not images, you know, because uh, you always have some way of, of, um, of visualizing uh, stuff and then have some way of subjectively uh, assessing whether this is a realistic sample or not. Well, some cases may be more difficult than others, but... <laughs> yeah, right. So, um, but I mean, we can, we can safely think uh, or imagine uh, we work with images here. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the way to visualize images is pretty straightforward, right? But uh, sure. I think, you know, even, even if you have like high dimensional data, there's some way of, uh, of like making visualizations uh, that kind of inform you whether this is or is not uh, a realistic uh, sample or distribution of samples. So visual inspection uh, can be done once the generator has been trained. And obviously during training, you don't necessarily know when to stop, right? You wanna stop before the generator loses modes. Um, and you can do that by just, you know, every couple of epochs, uh, you know, you, you export a couple of samples and then you look at them. Of course, you can also use um, more humans, not just yourself, but, uh, you know, maybe colleagues uh, in your lab or, um, or fellow students or people that uh, you pay on Amazon Turk, that's what people actually do, um, that then have to tell you whether your distribution of data looks realistic, whether it has you know, um, enough variability to be realistic and so on, right? But that, that is expensive and it's still subjective, although you, know, you objectify uh, you know, by looking at a population of, uh, of humans. And you know, the problem of overfitting, so the generator can learn specific examples uh, by heart, let's say, 
Uh, you, can, you can find these by looking at nearest neighbor matches of samples that have been generated to samples in your data set. And, uh, you know, of course, if you have those labels, you know, if you know which, which images are dogs or cats, you can actually uh, compute some heuristics to know whether this mode has been lost or not. Um, and I'm gonna conclude um, this small section here with something that's called inception score. So we do have uh, some means, at least in the image universe, to quantify how well uh, your generator generates uh, uh, samples. And this relates to two different dimensions. So first of all, you want your samples to have uh, low entropy, right? So um, it should be clear uh, to an interpreter that this is something meaningful. And uh, so the interpreter here is a um, neural network that's, uh, that was invented by Google. It's called Inception. And, you know, it consists of, of many, many layers and these modules here that, that are called inception modules. And in, in the end, it spits out a thousand dimensional label uh, or class vector. Um, you know, this, this model has been trained on ImageNet. So, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, so if you have images, you can put these in and then collect your thousand dimensional uh, label distribution. And, you know, <clears throat> samples that have been generated uh, are, support, are supposed or are required to have low entropy. That means it's, you know, the, 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 the inception uh, network should think of this as a thing, you know, with a li uh, high likelihood of high probability. And so for example, if it spits out a, a vector like this, it's uh, unsure what it is. It can't tell whether it's a dog or a cat or a mouse or an, or an elephant. Mm -hmm. um, and that means it has high entropy. So that's something bad for a single sample. Now, what your generator is also supposed to do is to generate not just one image uh, and always the same image, it should uh, generate a wide variety of different images. So, um, you know, in contrast to what we expect uh, this network to spit out, uh, if you feed it one sample, uh, we want, uh, this output distribution to be as broad and, you know, as uniform as possible for um, a set of images. So we would uh, generate a lot of images and feed all these into the network, you know, one by one. And then we add up all those uh, uh, label distributions. And then if we find something like that, that's good. Uh, so these two things are the main ingredients for the inception score. Now, I have to tell okay, you. So, uh, so yeah. let me see if I get this. So yeah. for one sample, the distribution on the right is good for, you know, it's bad. For it's bad. multiple sample, it's good, right? Exactly, exactly. Shortly encapsulated. Yeah. So now the question is, how do we combine this, um, this verbal description into a number, yeah? Mm -hmm. That we then compare uh, you know, between different GANs, different uh, loss functions, all these things. Um, so what we do is we use the KL divergence um, between the single label distribution. So we call this P of Y given X. So that's the probability of each of these labels uh, given the input X. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, as I just told you before, we, we, um, we integrate over many, many of these X's um, such that we obtain the marginal distribution P of Y. So that's the distribution of labels um, that the generator is able to um, uh, generate, right? So, mm -hmm. and the KL divergence now gives us um, like, like an if, or information about how much a single sample differs from this kind of baseline distribution, yeah? And so we do this for many, many samples. So we, we, com so we, we have our P of Y and then we, we compute uh, for many different X's, this P uh, of Y given X and, and the KL divergence. And then we uh, average this. So the expected value of many, many X is basically, so E to this 
uh, number is the inception score. So in the variational autoencoder, having a high kullback leibler divergence was bad because it was meant a high loss. In this case, it, it's good because it means uh, low exactly. entropy in one case and high entropy in the other. Exactly. Okay. Right? Um, okay, so I think uh, we covered um, a little bit of this uh, evaluation uh, procedures here. Um, I want to conclude with uh, an example uh, of a GAN that was developed in my lab uh, by uh, a PhD student of, of, of ours here, Leon, um, who uh, made beautiful use of this GAN concept, um, which it was motivated by a task that I gave him um, when he came in my lab uh, as a bachelor student. And so in our project with Beast, we um, glue those, uh, this curious uh, tags on their backs to be able to identify them uniquely, right? So each of these patterns here corresponds to a number uh, of zero to uh, 4,095. And so his task was, uh, train in, uh, a confnet to decode this number. And he said, well, that, that may, means a lot of labeled uh, data. So wh wh where do I get the data? And I said, well, maybe you, you can label that. And he said, no, I'm not gonna do this. This, this takes ages. I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna invent something. And I said, okay, okay, go ahead. And, uh, and in the end, he, uh, he, he proposed something that's called uh, Rand again. And that's, that's, that's well, the most cited paper in my lab, and this is how it works. Um, so that um, the cool thing about the tags was that we had a 3D model of it. And that was the, the door to kind of use the GAN to learn how to generate images that we can def you know, define in terms of the labels that we that we see in them, so that the rotation in space, the orientation, right, on those animals, and also the 12 bits um, in, you know, arranged in this arc. So the structure of the Rendigan now uh, it looks like this. So we had a 3D model, right? So that spits out images that look very clean, very unrealistic. Uh, so training a decoder network on these kind of images didn't really work well. You know? So we couldn't decode those tags on the bees with a network that was trained on this clean data. But we can use a set of augmentation functions mm -hmm. um, that each add you know, a certain property of real world images. So you know, we, for example, sometimes uh, have blur because bees move out of focus and there's um, heterogeneous uh, lighting patterns because there's a little shadow cast from one bee and, and direct lighting, um, you know, on another part. And that, that could be done by another function um, that augments the previous um, image. And of course we have background that looks uh, different than just this black uh, background here, and we have high um, high frequency um, artifacts like sensor noise or compression, uh, you know, artifacts. And all these parts are pretty general for for any vision pipeline or any imaging pipeline. And so the generator now learns to uh, use the correct parameters of these functions. So the blur, for example, takes a single parameter, which is the, the, the standard deviation of a Gaussian kernel and lighting and background and um, you know this high frequency details, they have a mask um, as big as the output that practically is uh, you know, a set of parameters that the generator can, can, uh, can uh, come up with. And so this final image then was, was given to the discriminator and also unlabeled uh, samples of real uh, B tags. And just as we saw, uh, the, the error 
uh, was back propped into the generator so we so uh, we end up um, being able to generate different uh, visualizations of uh, different um, versions of the same tag yeah so we could say okay generate this kind of uh, configuration and then by by uh, changing the z value um, the, the noise we can generate different uh, versions of that same pattern. And these have been then used to train a decoder network and um, the decoder network, you know, which only saw this synthetic data was then uh, tested on real data and, and performed beautifully. Okay, so I think um, there's so much more to say about GANs, we have to conclude we have to conclude this lecture. And uh, so let's do the summary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You take over the first part? Um, let, me, let me do this and maybe you, you can do the second one. Okay. Uh, so GANs can learn very complex data distributions. We saw images, right? So these are high dimensional, very complex uh, scenes um, that, are, that have been thought to be impossible to generate. Uh, just a few years ago. And the cool thing is that this is possible with a very simple learning signal. Uh, so the generator just says yay or nay or something in between and that is sufficient for the, for the generator to know how to improve. We usually map this signal uh, the, uh, from a simple distribution, uh, P of Z. And uh, so remember that Z, it will come, uh, you know, in different uh, realizations. So Z probably, uh, you know, will be some latent uh, activations within some network or was in the previous lecture, the bottleneck activations. And here are the random samples that we feed into the generator. Um, that's, a, that's a very nice trick um, <clears throat> uh, that I think uh, theoretically um, is, is very, is a very rich problem that I would like to cover, but we have no time. Um, and also there's a multitude of follow-up work. So uh, like we saw in the beginning, there's hundreds of hundreds of papers of different variants. Uh, I, I haven't read all of them obviously, but we invite you to uh, write, uh, you know, your favorite GAN paper in, in the comment section. And I think now you, Luis, should go ahead and tell us um, the summary of your part. Yeah, let's not forget why we had all those uh, different follow-up work. So that's because, remember, the vanilla guns were really unstable to train due to the min-max optimization problem. And uh, Tim, I think you need to go forward now. Will, yeah, will. But, okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, one of the, or maybe probably the most important of these problems that we had was the mode dropping or collapse problem where remember all those modes so for example for MNIST all of the digits would collapse into one single mode and um, then the other problem that was also really difficult was uh, bad convergence behavior either to oscillation so getting stuck in infinite loops or just taking a long time to train. And we proposed several solutions for some of those problems, such as a uh, C gun or Wasserstein gun, but there are many, many more solutions as uh, Tim already pointed out. And yeah, maybe you want to talk about this, Tim? So this was- Well, I mean, yeah, so we just talked about, uh, you know, heuristics, how to validate um, specifically the inception score. Um, there, are, there are many more, um, I think we could, we could uh, record a new lecture on this. Uh, but for now, I think this was the core uh, of what's important in, in this uh, class, in this machine learning class. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was not too long. Um, was, uh, it was a long lecture, was it? Yeah, it was a long lecture and it took a long time for us to finish it. I hope uh, the students are not too, uh, too right. annoyed. <laughs> okay, the next one will be will be following Swift. You take care. Have a great weekend. Have a great uh, next week. See you all on Monday. Bye, everyone. Bye.